Okay, it's Sunday, October 22nd, 2023, 1.48 p.m. We're doing a tour of the Compton Heights neighborhood. We're going to be on a tour with Nathan Jackson from St. Louis History and Architecture. We're three miles from the Gateway Arch. Built in 1898, this is the newest of the three St. Louis water towers. This is the Compton Hill Reservoir. There's Highway 44 on this side of it. And right down there you can see the arch. That's the Naked Truth statue in honor of Carl Schurz and two other newspaper editors. He was a journalist and an editor, and he was the first German-American senator from the state of Missouri, lived here in St. Louis. He was born in Germany, came over here, and uh, Carl Schurz Park in New York is named after him as well. That's where Gracie Mansion is, where the mayor of New York works and lives. He employed Joseph Pulitzer, who was a Missouri state rep, and he bought the uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch at an auction at the old courthouse in 1878, and he also moved to New York and ended up becoming a congressman from New York, Joseph Pulitzer did. So that's the Naked Truth statue. Adolphus Bush wanted to put it there in 1914. They made it bronze to kind of tamp down the nudity in honor of Carl Schurz and two other newspaper editors. That's the Compton Hill Water Tower. So we're doing a tour of the Compton Heights neighborhood, one of 79 neighborhoods here in the city of St. Louis. Uh, my name is Nathan Jackson, and I run the Facebook page and tour company St. Louis History and Architecture. I write history on different 19th and early 20th century buildings around the city of St. Louis as well as giving walking tours of roughly nine different neighborhoods, including multiple tours of Seward. Uh, today we're going to be doing Compton Heights and discussing uh, the history of the neighborhood. I call it Germans of Gilded Age St. Louis because really this neighborhood, especially around the turn of the century, had become a very wealthy enclave in St. Louis mostly for uh, the Germans of high society who lived in St. Louis. Right here, we are standing in front of something called the Naked Truth Statue. And the Naked Truth Statue was unveiled in 1914. Uh, on the back, they have some of the uh, people who donated the money to have the statue uh, dedicated and uh, and uh, one of those was uh, the family of Emil Pretorius and he actually I think lived in Lafayette Square for a while but uh, Emil Pretorius uh, was head of one of the German language newspapers in St. Louis uh, the Westwich Post and the Westwich Post was a long time uh, German language newspaper. One thing about German language newspapers, long before this neighborhood actually was settled and uh, developed, back around the time before the Civil War, uh, a lot of these Germans were abolitionists, and because uh, they could write in German, they were able to really freely speak about their abolitionist views in said German language newspapers. Fast forward 50 years, 60 years, uh, to 1914, and the paper is still running, and one of the things they funded was the Naked Truth statue. It was quite controversial at the time, hence why it's called the Naked Truth, and uh, they, uh, to make it so that the uh, 
statue, I guess, wasn't quite as offensive to some. They cast it in bronze, so the nudeness wasn't as popping, I guess. Uh, <laughs> basically, uh, basically, it, it got a lot of flack, especially back in 1914, for having uh, nudity in public art. And even in recent times, there's still been things that uh, have caused issue. Like, uh, when this statue was featured on a YouTube channel, uh, it, they had to blur out uh, the nudity. Even, and this is, this is like not very long ago, so it's still, even in uh, more recent times, has its share of controversies. I believe it also had uh, some controversy in like 2012 or something during like an Occupy uh, protest or something, but and they came in like graffitied on it or something. But it, it, it's got actually a pretty fascinating history of this statue here. But it was uh, dedicated by the German community of Compton Heights. Uh, it was unveiled in 1914. So, now we'll get to more of the history of the reservoir and the water tower. And those are absolutely uh, interlinked. Uh, so, you think, it's like, why would you have a reservoir and then a water tower? And that's because this water tower actually did not hold water. That's not the function of these water towers. They're what was called a standpipe. And a standpipe basically has a little pipe that goes up and monitors the water pressure uh, and in the pipes so that way the pipes in the city didn't burst. And that's because the way that they did the water pressure and things like that required them to have this standpipe water tower to monitor it. And this was the third of three uh, standpipe water towers constructed in the city of St. Louis. This one was built in 1898 by Harvey Ellis in the uh, Rowanesque revival style. The reservoir has actually been here quite a bit longer than that. Uh, so back in 1855, the city expanded the city limits out to Grand Boulevard. and. Uh, Grand Boulevard was, by the way, uh, the brainchild of Hiram Leffingwell. And Hiram Leffingwell was a huge city booster and also a major Whig Party support. Not only did he do Grand Boulevard, he also did St. Louis Place. And that was a little bit earlier than that. And then he also founded the city of Kirkwood. And he, later on, was one of the major backers of creating Forest Park. So, quite the uh, resume there in the uh, middle of the 19th century. And at this time, uh, they made several of the uh, areas way out in the uh, edge of the city different, uh, had different functions like uh, that would be far away from everything like uh, and one of those functions for some of the uh, plots of land was a reservoir and this one ended up being a reservoir they subdivided all of the city commons in 1854-55 because they were preparing to expand and so anything with city blocks numbered like in the 1000s roughly that's probably part of that subdivision of the city commons and a lot of these areas that we're going to be walking through today in fact did have uh, city blocks numbered in the 1000s uh, so they uh, built this reservoir down here they also built another one north right where the NGA uh, is going in today there used to be another reservoir that was located in that area as well. Uh, so that was their north.
North Reservoir and this was the South Reservoir. And uh, at that time, St. Louis's water was actually cloudy. It just came straight from the Mississippi right to the taps. And so in the reservoir, they actually had to dredge the bottom of the reservoir because it would fill with silt from the river. And uh, this went on until 1904. And the only reason they stopped in 1904 was because in that year, uh, when the World's Fair was about to uh, go underway, they didn't want the fountains to run brown. So they hurriedly hired somebody to uh, try to uh, create a water filtration and treatment system. And so up by the chain of rocks, they created the uh, modern system of water treatment, which they still use today, where they had it go through a series of lakes and they put like a binding agent in the water that uh, bound out all of the uh, um, particulates that were in the water and so they'd sink to the bottom and all the clean water was up, up top and that was the water that went through uh, the pipes and things like that for the fair and they were able to get it successfully done before the fair started and so the fountains were able to run clear water and St. Louis had uh, clear tap water for the first time so and St. Louis today is known for having some of the uh, cleanest and uh, highest quality tap water of any city in the country. I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about uh, the streets and how they were laid out uh, within the city of St. Louis, especially in South City, uh, around the time that the area was expanded out to Grand Boulevard. So basically, uh, I was talking a little bit earlier about how they subdivided the city commons. Uh, in the south part of the city uh, in 1855 and so at that time they had to plant a large section of the street grid because the city was completely undeveloped out here and it would still actually be farmland all around here for several decades after uh, they got out here this far but basically uh, all of the streets in St. Louis to the south were uh, named in a very specific uh, pattern so all the streets going from north to south were named after states and all of the streets going east to west were either named after Native American tribes or rivers so, uh, for example, you would have uh, Louisiana, Virginia, uh, Missouri, Mississippi. Uh, well, those were actually plotted much earlier than the others, uh, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, you had Arkansas, uh, but yeah, you get the idea, Indiana, and they were all uh, north to south streets. And east to west streets were named things like Cherokee and Chippewa and uh, Winnebago and various other things like that. Some of the streets over here were actually renamed later. So originally, uh, Russell out in this part of the city was named Pontiac Street. It was only uh, named Russell originally down in uh, William Russell's uh, area in Seward and uh, going out to McKinley Heights. So that was where it was originally called Russell and Allen was originally uh, didn't come out this far either. Uh, there was also uh, Geyer over here was called uh, Delaware and it would have been after the Delaware River I guess and not the state because sometimes it's confusing but, uh, like, for example, if you're going a lot further south, uh, Utah is state. 
but when in, in 1855 it was not a state uh, it actually didn't become a state until 1896 so uh, and Wyoming as well so those, those two streets were actually not states when they were the streets were named they were named that well before so I'm not exactly sure uh, if those were Native American tribes or rivers or whatnot, but they actually do follow that naming system. So that's sort of how all of this area uh, was developed, except for when we get on to the actual Compton Heights subdivision, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get down there. But that has a whole different uh, street naming scheme. But the area is. Uh, right here they were all part of that south side uh naming scheme for the streets now we'll cross over uh russell and start heading down that way right here we're out in front of the magic chef mansion and the magic chef mansion uh was designed for uh, Charles Stockstrom by architect Ernst C. Jensen between 1906 and 1908. And it was actually uh, designed to uh, look like a lot of the castles that had been built in Germany, uh, one in particular, the Schloss Schwerin. And uh, so it has a lot of like German, Baroque type features throughout the design of the home and this is one of the largest homes to be constructed in South St. Louis roughly about 12,000 square feet so you can actually take tours uh, once a month of the Magic Chef Mansion they open it up to the public the current owners uh, basically charge admission and that helps with the renovations of the mansion and uh, as you can see, they're currently uh, doing some uh, renovations on it right now. But, uh, yeah, it's open about once a month, and uh, you can go inside and uh, learn more about this mansion. One really cool feature, it has a bowling alley in the basement. So, uh, one of uh, the, it is the largest home in Compton Heights and one of the largest homes in South St. Louis. And that sat on the side of each one of these. And you can see that this one still has the retaining wall from the original mansion that would have sat here. On the 1875 Competent Dry Map, which uh, was unrelated to the name of the neighborhood, uh, they, basically, the Compton Dry Map, for those who don't know, is a hand-drawn map of the city of St. Louis in 1875, where they went up in a hot air balloon and detailed uh, out all of the different buildings in the whole city. And you can see exactly what the city looked like. So, uh, the, uh, in this area, actually right along Russell, which was again at the time called Pontiac Street, they actually had multiple mansions in the Second Empire style that were built all along uh, this section right here. So uh, most of them all have been demolished, and they were demolished at various points. A lot of them in the 1950s, though. State Street and. Uh, as you can see here, you have like uh, a number of uh, homes which kind of have some uh, Queen Anne and Romanesque revival uh, elements as well as a little bit of like a American four square type plan. And you can see that through like the hip roof up top. These would have been built in the early 1890s. And really, uh, these aren't actually like the best examples of Richardsonian Romanesque uh, style architecture. They just have a couple of uh, elements from it which were very 
popular at the time. But as we actually go on to the uh, Hawthorne, Longfellow, and those streets, you'll see some much more uh, elaborate examples of Romanesque Revival uh, style architecture. But you can still see they have some of the uh, heavy, uh, wide arches uh, over those windows right there, and a little bit of the uh, stone features throughout uh, the design. And those uh, hail from the Romanesque Revival uh, style of architecture, and it has that American four square plan as well, where it's got the hip roof and it's fairly square in shape, and uh, those were very popular around the turn of the 20th century. So these would have been like uh, upper middle class uh, residences on this street and in this particular area. Uh, more of that uh, Romanesque survival type uh, architecture as uh, Italian style uh, four family or maybe two family flats at the time. Uh, they're definitely two family today, but. Uh, Basically, uh, the Italian style uh, originated in the 1840s, and it was actually uh, started in Great Britain. A lot of wealthy Americans, or early Americans and uh, British people, would go take grand tours of uh, Italy and Greece and whatnot, and hence you would get the Greek Revival style and the Italian style from the buildings that they saw on their grand tours. And that's sort of how it gained its popularity. And originally you had a lot of country villas, such as the Henry Shaw House uh, in uh, the Botanical Gardens. That's a really excellent example of an early Italian country villa. And there were actually a couple of country villas located right where Highway 44 is today. And just up uh, right alongside the reservoir and across the highway around where Grand and Lafayette Avenue is there is something called the George F. Tower mansion that was like right on that corner and uh, all, all of the uh, Italian country villas that were uh, out in this area have since been demolished. One of the most famous would have been James B. Eads mansion which actually might have been larger than the Magic Chef and that was actually demolished by St. Louis University in the 1930s. But it's Terry Park is where that uh, was today. Yeah, if you if you ever actually take the time to look, St. Louis University has actually uh, not been the best at preserving uh, buildings. <laughs> they were actually going to tear down the Samuel Couples Mansion too, until one of the fathers was like over my dead body, basically. Back to the history of the Italian style, then you get to the time after the Civil War, roughly 1865 to 1870, and they start building them with pitched roofs and uh, very classical proportions similar to your earlier Federal and Greek Revival style buildings, and they're built as townhouses, and sometimes you also have these big uh, pitched, or these big uh, hipped roof townhouses that were built around that time as well. You'll see a bunch of those in Lafayette Square and a number of them in Benton Park as well. So basically that's where the style was right in the years after the Civil War. Around 1880 they started uh, like I guess with improvements in gutter technology and things like that they were able to uh, build a lot more buildings with flat roofs. So uh, you really start to see flat roofed Italian style buildings like these starting around that time. And th these would have had a number of different uh, residents in them. Uh, one of the guys who lived here was uh, like a doctor or surgeon, I believe. And he was living here in about 1885. Italian style and Second Empire style are some of the earliest buildings in Compton Heights and predate the subdivision over there that we'll be getting to in a minute. This building uh, here, uh, built in 1884, 
and one of its residents uh, was the uh, worked for Belcher Sugar Refinery uh, up in no along the North River front. And uh, basically, uh, Belcher Sugar Refinery and they apparently built one of the tallest uh, buildings in St. Louis at the time. I think it was like uh, 10 or 15 stories in a time when buildings generally were five or six, even in the downtown area. And later on in 1892, Belcher Sugar Refinery actually opened hot springs in downtown St. Louis. So at 4th and Del Mar, there used to be the Belcher Hot Springs. And so you, know, you go to Arkansas for the hot springs and things today. They used to have one right in downtown St. Louis. And the building where they had the hot springs uh, was there until 1976, which was probably torn down for the convention center uh, and various things because it's kind of right on that site. It's really uh, one of the uh, early mansions that were on the street, uh, and uh, this was built for a guy named Max Orthwine, who was the president of the Peroxident Manufacturing Company. And you probably, if you've lived in St. Louis for any amount of time recognized the name Orthwine as they were a very wealthy and prominent and very philanthropic uh, family throughout St. Louis and a lot of buildings around town have uh, their name on it because they donated the money uh, towards said organization. Uh, one example I know of for sure is at the St. Louis Zoo uh, they donated money to one of the buildings there and so uh, one of them is called like the Orthwine Pavilion or something so uh, the Orthwine family was very very wealthy and even going back to 1894 when this uh, building was built in the Romanesque revival style a great example of the Second Empire style and uh, this building and really what delineates the Second Empire style is that uh, buildings built in the style uh, they originated in France during Napoleon III's Second Empire and that's how they got their name. Uh, Napoleon III hired Baron von Haussmann to design multiple uh, buildings throughout the city of Paris uh, which were like five or six stories high and on the top floor they had what's called a mansard roof and the mansard roof basically acted as a living space in the attic and in France at the time people were taxed uh, based on the number of floors they had but if the top floor was a roof it wasn't really a floor so they uh, <laughs> basically were able to avoid taxes. Now the style became popular in the United States following the end of the Civil War, uh, beginning around 1865, 1866 here in St. Louis, and St. Louis really, really loved the style, and so it remained popular well into the 1890s. This one was built in 1886 for a banker named William Hammerstein, and one thing you'll notice about this building is that you got a limestone front on it and a lot of times to decorate the built fronts of buildings from the 1870s and 1880s a lot of the wealthy people decided to uh, front them with limestone because it was more expensive than brick and it was basically just a way to show off your wealth it had no real functional or uh, like it didn't have a functional purpose it was just basically a status symbol. Mm -hmm. It was kind of almost a just decorative mansard as opposed to a more functional one with the 
full Thormers and whatnot. So you, you, you do absolutely see that, especially later on. Like in these two uh, buildings next door, which we're about to talk about. Uh, one of the owners, the owner of this building was a guy named Lamar Ayers, who uh, worked for a dry goods company uh, downtown uh, and uh, lived in this house for a number of years. Uh, this one here, uh, you have the three little keystone pieces, and that was actually very commonly seen in St. Louis throughout the uh, 1880s. There were a few examples that you would see in the late 1870s, and some going all the way as late to like uh, the early 1890s even. But for the most part, uh, it was very much an 1880s stylistic uh, feature to have the uh, little limestone keystone pieces. Next door, uh, this one was actually built for uh, um, Erastus Warner. And Erastus Warner was a lumber bear. And uh, Erastus Warner uh, originally lived in Denver, Colorado. He was actually one of the first residents of the city way back in like the 1850s and 60s, before Colorado even became a state decided to, uh, after being there for a number of years, move back to St. Louis, and he lived here uh, around 1887, just for one year before he decided to uh, have his mansion constructed on Grand Boulevard, right across from the water tower, and that mansion over there was constructed by uh, Theodore Link, the famous architect who did Union Station. Buildings behind us here these are, uh, these were constructed in 1883. Well, these three were that flounder house on the end. We'll talk about that in a second. But that one was constructed in 1885. But these three uh, row houses here were constructed in 1883, uh, featuring the uh, two-story bay windows. And they actually appear on the 1883 Hopkins Atlas, which is a fire insurance map uh, at the time and it showed all the buildings whether or not they were built out of brick or stone and or wood or whatever material and you can see these buildings on that particular atlas. Uh, two of the uh, most significant residents were architects and uh, builders uh, Frederick and William Bonsack and the Bonsacks uh, actually uh, designed a number of uh, really nice uh, mansions and things like that in the central west end. They later, uh, Frederick Bonsack later moved to a house on, in the like 51 or 5200 block of Washington over, uh, it would be called Washington Place today, uh, not in Washington Terrace just so we're clear on that, but uh, basically uh, Bonsack was a really renowned uh, architect and builder, and he was, he also had a draftsman named Adolf Sobek who was living in uh, these residences at the time. These buildings have bay windows, which basically a bay window uh, allows for natural lighting to penetrate into the home at multiple different angles. And that's why you had it uh, offset like that, because at the time, light bulbs had been invented by then, but they were about four years old in 1883. Uh, so it was quite a while before a lot of homes uh, ended up getting a lot of light bulbs, so they still relied a lot on natural lighting. And uh, so that's one of the reasons behind uh, the bay windows. And this middle example, as you can see, has what's called stone on it, and that was oftentimes in the 1950s they tried to modernize a lot of buildings by uh, putting this kind of concrete stone over the front side of the building. Luckily, St. Louis doesn't have too many buildings that have been uh, updated with 
form stone in the papers. Uh, most of the buildings were changed in brick. A lot of some of them even had real stone. But uh, you see this one. There's one in Old North St. Louis, which I know of, and uh, a couple in Fox Park and Bank Park. The uh, form stone as well. But luckily, it's just a handful of buildings that were uh, not very tastefully uh, updated in the 1950s. The one next to Caleb's house has that. Yeah, that's, that's another example. It is, it's just exactly like the underneath, it's still yeah. under there, it's just, it's, they basically stuck that concrete over the front. This is what's called a flounder house right here. And it's kind of hard to see from uh, this close to the building, but the roof actually slants to one side and uh, that's so the water can run off and so that they can share a wall with the neighboring house. And this was introduced by German immigrants in the 1840s and it remained popular uh, in uh, St. Louis architecture all the way into the 1880s. This being one of the latest examples built around 1885. And uh, basically uh, the flower house is called as such because the taller wall it's just a flat brick wall, and all the features are along the other sides of the building. Kind of like how a flounder fish has its fins and its eyes on one side of its body. So that's kind of how it got its name. And uh, St. Louis is the highest number of examples of any uh, city in the country, with about 270 examples throughout the city total. Roughly 75 of said examples are in Seward. And that's about the same as the uh, second most city, Alexandria, Virginia, has as a whole city. So St. Louis, by far and away, if we demolished two-thirds of our flounder houses, we'd still have the most of any city. So. In 1875, on that Compton Dry map, where all these bungalows were over here, that's where the estate of Julius Pittsman was. And we'll talk more about Julius Pittsman in a second. His, he's actually one of the city's premier private street designers, but his mansion actually used to sit right on this block of land right here, and it was torn down in 1914 to build all the bungalows. So, he actually moved to Kingsbury Place in, I believe, around that time right side of the street, that second house, that was built in a uh, Romanesque revival style. Unfortunately, like this big uh, um, shipping container is kind of blocking. See the second one down, that one was built in uh, 1894 for a guy named Charles Vogel. And interestingly enough, Vogel uh, actually, as a kid, he was the, a drummer boy uh, for the Union Army uh, in the Civil War. And then after he uh, grew up, he became a wealthy businessman downtown and had his mansion constructed right there in 1894. The one you see right behind you here, this one was built for a guy named Louis Kaminsky in the Italian style in 1885. It's a very late example of a pitch roof Italian style structure. The, one of the main things of the Italian style large bracket wooden ones and that's really what they all have to be very tall type of thing. It was built in 1887. Uh, and it was built for uh, Appleton S. Bridges who was the secretary with uh, the building company uh, Henry Chinkin and Henry Chinkin was his boss so uh, he 
and it failed in 1887. And uh, Henry Jenkin actually liked the house so much he decided to buy it from uh, Appleton S. Bridges sometime in the uh, mid-1890s. And so uh, Henry Tinkin was uh, one of the later, uh, or uh, one of the second people to uh, have lived here. And Henry Tinkin again ran like a, a carpentry and building uh, company. This is kind of an interesting example of the Second Empire style because it has that uh, big, wide, uh, multiple window and uh, the little double uh, arch window you see on that second floor. This one is kind of a more eclectic uh, example of that second empire style and this is very late in that uh, period of when that architectural style was popular. Also you can see it has the little thin windows on the side there. Likely that's where they would have had a stairs. oldest house uh, still standing in this uh, block right here, which is one of the oldest blocks in the Compton Heights neighborhood. There are a couple of older houses than these, but uh, this is uh, probably uh, about the third or fourth oldest surviving home in the neighborhood, built in 1882. The apartment building on the corner here, that was built in 1910. Before we really get headed into the uh, Compton Heights subdivision, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the guy who founded the subdivision, Henry C. Harstick. And Henry C. Harstick actually used to have a mansion right where the Berea Church is located today. So, uh, basically, uh, Henry C. Harstick uh, was a very uh, wealthy businessman, and he decided in 1889 to uh, set aside uh, a couple of blocks of land over here as the Compton Heights subdivision. He hired the famous uh, landscape architect and uh, surveyor, Julius Pitzman, to design uh, the streets for Compton Heights and he laid them out in a kind of a linear pattern. He basically uh, had a teardrop. Named, he had the streets all named after literary figures. So that's how you get Hawthorne and Longfellow and uh, Milton Streets. And then Akamak was actually part of the state's Native American tribes. Uh, naming scheme and they just kept the name after the street. But basically all this area here that was all developed beginning in 1889. Henry C. Harsley, he lived in a mansion right on the corner there and then ended up uh, he later on by the early 20th century, I think around 1913, he decided to move to Clayton, and he built his mansion at uh, Brentmore Park. So, even larger and uh, more elaborate mansions over in Brentmore Park. This house here was built in 1886, and it was constructed for Otto F. Schmitz, who is a civil engineer and draftsman for Julius Pittsman, and had the home constructed in 1886, featuring some uh, Queen Anne influence, as well as a little bit of what was known as the shingle style at the time. Uh, usually shingle style uh, homes are actually wood frame uh, construction, but they have the uh, roof shingles going all the way down the side of the gable. And you can kind of see a little bit of that influence here in this home as well, even though I wouldn't technically call this a shingle style home, it would be more of a clean end, but no. it has that influence.
I see especially around that time is where they took a little bit of this and a little bit of that and mixed a lot of those styles together and that that is uh, very common and you uh, just see styles that you may not necessarily uh, see together sometimes they would stick elements from them together so yeah that's absolutely right uh, coming back to this intersection later, we're going to go to the next street down, and it, because of that teardrop shape, the streets loop back around. So. Oops. 1905, and one thing you're going to notice uh, as we go through this neighborhood, uh, there's probably about a dozen of the people who were uh, living in these houses were all uh, wholesale grocers. <laughs> a lot of these families were actually intermarried and uh, <laughs> so a lot of it was very much uh, well one family member moved here and so uh, a lot of other family members decided to move here and so it's a very uh, close-knit community especially back at the turn of the century. Yeah, this one definitely took a lot of mixing and matching of styles here. And it kind of also has like a little bit of that like neoclassical elements to it as well. And this house here, uh, it's kind of a plainer example of the Beaux Arts style, which uh, was really uh, came into vogue, especially following the end of the uh, Chicago World's Fair. And uh, this building was constructed in 1897 for uh, the uh, head of the uh, 4th National uh, Bay. As you can see, it has like those large uh, rounded bays and uh, hipped roof and various uh, styles. We'll see some uh, or stylistic features. Basically, August Gord, who was the head of the 4th National Bank, he was the one constructed in uh, 1894 for uh, Frederick Hoffman who was uh, head of the Hoffman Brothers Wholesale Grocery Company. So we're already in another one. Uh, and this was, it was designed by the famous architectural firm of Barnett, Haynes and Barnett. They didn't actually build too many homes in the uh, Compton Heights neighborhood. Most of their structures that were built were in the central west end and around there, like for example, the new cathedral and the gates to Kingsbury Place were some of their more famous designs. But they didn't, and they also built a lot of mansions along Washington Terrace, Portland Westmoreland Place, and various other sites around the Central West End. But this is really one of the only examples they built here. And it kind of has those little uh, uh, rounded bays out the side, kind of like the, uh, a lot uh, of those are they're very similar to like turrets that you see on uh, much uh, more like Romanesque style buildings just in the shape of the uh, bays here so they took on uh, at least a little bit of that uh, um, Romanesque influence although this really is more of a Beaux Arts style uh, building which the Beaux Arts was uh, one of the favorite style of Barnett, Haynes and Barnett so that makes sense. I also see Georgian was uh, died in 1893 by uh, Otto Wilhelmi, 
for Philip Berg. And Philip Berg was also a wholesale grocer. <laughs> so far, we haven't actually had any of the same family yet, but uh, uh, Otto Wilhelmy, really, if you look throughout the neighborhood, he really, really did like his turrets. So a lot of the houses that were designed by him had uh, big turreted features all throughout the buildings. And this is no exception. Uh, so Philip Berg actually uh, had his wholesale grocery company down at the French Market. The market was actually located around uh, South Broadway, about right where Highway 55 crosses over it uh, the first time, or like, well, not where the exit is, but where Highway 55 like has the overpass that goes over the top of. Mm -hmm. Uh, South Broadway, there's actually still a French Market Lane where French mm. Market used to be. And uh, it would have been one of the competitors with Seward Market back in uh, the 19th century and early 20th century. It was built for Henry Griesdeck Jr. And uh, it was designed in 1895 by architect Ernst Priestler. And it's one of the uh, largest examples of the uh, Romanesque revival style in the city of St. Louis. Uh, well, not in the whole city, but uh, definitely the largest example uh, in this neighborhood and one of the larger ones in South St. Louis, the Samuel Couples Mansion is by far and away the largest in the city. But uh, basically, the Griesedek family, uh, they uh, brewed beer beginning around 18, uh, or around 1766 in Germany, and 100 years later, in 1866, they uh, moved to St. Louis, and uh, Anton Griesedek opened up uh, his brewery here in St. Louis, and the Grisek family moved around uh, the Seward area for a little while. Eventually, he, uh, Anton Grisek had a mansion uh, in, I believe, the 1500 block of Lamy. And his original mansion that he had was torn down uh, for Highway 55. Of course, this is long after his death, but uh, he had moved from his uh, original mansion over to a stone-fronted mansion on Lafayette Avenue, which also still stands. He lived there uh, between about 1894 and 1900. And then Anton Grisedek moved in with Henry Jr. and uh, began living at this address in 1900 to 1901 about. But the Grisedek family was quite the significant uh, brewing family here in St. Louis, even after they survived Prohibition, just like Anheuser-Busch, and uh, they continued to produce uh, beer for a number of years, eventually selling off to Falstaff, but back in the 1940s and 50s, Griesedek Brothers Beer was uh, one of the largest uh, breweries here in St. Louis alongside uh, Anheuser-Busch. Something else interesting about the Griesedek family is that uh, the IBC Root Beer, that was actually uh, independent brewing companies, uh, and basically uh, IBC was one of their products during Prohibition to help them get through uh, while they couldn't actually brew actual beer, so they made root beer. Anheuser-Busch, funny enough, also made root beer, but... Uh, both of them ended up surviving, and companies like Lemp and the St. Louis Brewing Association ended up going under. But IBC Root Beer is a legacy of the Griesedek uh, family's brewing empire. This home was actually constructed by uh, Ernst C. Jansen for Louis Stockstrom. So, technically, uh, 
another Magic Chef mansion because uh, originally at the time the Magic Chef company was called the Quick Meal Stove Company and they later became called the Magic Chef after their most famous product really really took off and so they changed their name to Magic Chef but uh, originally they were called the Quick Meal Stove Company and Louis Stockstone Strom was actually uh, the president of the company and he had this mansion built by uh, um, Ernst C. Jansen in 1903. This is a more typical example of your Beaux Arts uh, mansion. You have a lot of those classical and Renaissance uh, elements to it, uh, which is very common for a lot of the uh, Beaux Arts style uh, buildings. And they were just very elaborate and over the top. And something interesting is that when the Beaux Arts style uh, came into vogue, a lot of uh, more modern leaning architects, uh, I guess, and some of these may have been architectural uh, historians later on who were more leaning towards the modernist movement, uh, are quoted as saying that they thought that uh, the Beaux Arts style set architecture back by 40 years. <laughs> but uh, really, most people today consider, uh, especially like people who are not in the architecture profession, would consider Beaux Arts buildings to be some of the most beautiful and elaborate buildings that were constructed at that time. And the St. Louis World's Fair had was basically all built in that style. It wasn't too much after uh, this was built that concrete block became a fairly common material in house building. In fact, an entire district in the West End, which is different than the Central West End, uh, where they have concrete block houses being uh, it's like a whole historic district called the Julian Avenue Concrete Block District. Yeah, it's north. It's north of Del Mar, so it's uh, it's like north of Del Mar, but south of Page and west of Union. So this was built uh, for Herman Meyer, also uh, by Ernst C. Jansen, and uh, Meyer was head of the Meyer Schmidt Wholesale Grocery Company. <laughs> so yet another, and it's another example of the Beaux Arts style. This one is equally as elaborate to the others. And as you can see, uh, such an elaborate home requires quite elaborate maintenance. So definitely has a little bit of work it needs done on the corner. Something like that, something like that would cost tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Here you have the hitching post. This is where you tie your horse up uh, while you stayed at someone's house. And this is a carriage block. And you'd step up onto the carriage block. And this is so you didn't have to uh, go step into the dirty street, which was probably filled with horse manure. And you'd step into the carriage. Especially if you were a woman, you wouldn't want your skirt dragged through horse manure. So that's why they had that. Also in the also in the late 19th century, they had a thing about ankles, and they, you didn't want to show your ankles, so you just go right here to that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's it's amazing that uh, St. Louis actually legalized prostitution during the Victorian period, despite all of these uh, very rigid rules, but. That's a whole other topic of conversation, and it actually ties into my Lafayette Square tour, so.
come on that tour and you'll learn about how St. Louis legalized prostitution. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to go across the street now. Yeah. Do you see those little round mushroom type tape things? Yeah, those are like to, uh, for the snow and ice. Because yeah. it's a very, very high pitched roof. Oh, and I almost forgot to talk about that house, which is like one of the more important architectural designs in the neighborhood. It was designed in 1895 by uh, Theodore Link at Union Station. It really doesn't, if you look at it, it's not surprising that he would also design Union Station because they kind of have a similar... They're that white limestone and both are in the Richardsonian Romanesque style and have those big heavy stone features. Oftentimes Romanesque revival buildings were really meant to be like little mini stone castles and whatnot. And that was kind of the uh, influence of the style that was done by Henry Hobson Richardson. Richardson actually died in 1886 of kidney failure. And uh, his style, though, after really took off after he died. And for the next decade or so, it became one of the most popular uh, styles of uh, building for wealthy residents throughout the country. And you'll see many, many Romanesque style uh, buildings from during that time. St. Louis actually does have H.H. Uh, Richardson building still standing in the Midtown neighborhood. But, he did Trinity Church, right? He did Trinity Church in Boston, yes. That was one of his earliest works, and that was done in 1872. But uh, anyway, this uh, building here was built in an Italian Renaissance style for Henry W. Gildahouse. He's the first of our great wholesale grocer empire. Not our first wholesale grocer on the street, but there he was part of a whole family known as the. Uh, Decreeds, Wolfings, and Gilda Houses, and multiple family members all intermarried and were all related and uh, uh, had multiple houses built on the street. In fact, one of their descendants went on one of my tours. Mm -hmm. And they were blonde haired, blue eyed Germans, just like you'd <laughs> expect. And this house was uh, designed by architects Grable, Weber, and Groves. And Grable, Weber, and Groves are really known for uh, all their uh, works on Fullerton's Westminster Place. And so there's actually a nearly identical twin house to this one. And the main difference between this one and that one is the transom windows on this house are squares and on the other house they're round. They're both built in 1894 and uh, the other one uh, was built for a real estate uh, guy who uh, lived uh, on the street. Uh, I believe his name was Robert Goldstein. And uh, he worked at the uh, Wainwright building downtown. So one thing about Grable, Weber, and Groves is that Alfred Grable, his granddaughter was Betty Grable, the pinup girl. So this house, uh, speaking of Gilda House, uh, this was owned by Charles Gilda House, who built it in a uh, late 19th century kind of neoclassical style. Uh, really, the Greek Revival style was very popular in the uh, mid 19th century, and well, actually going back to the early 19th century, and. That's a lot of the times when you see homes with the big porticos and the columns and whatnot. But this home, in its actual proportions and the way in which the windows are designed, are much, much more similar to 
turn of the century uh, homes and it actually has a very different uh, window proportion and the home was built in 1896 so that makes a lot of sense. Charles Gildahouse was a real big fan of the classics and so uh, had his home designed in a classical Greek style as well with the big uh, ionic columns and whatnot. The proportions are actually more Roman than Greek. In 1908, uh, for Edmund uh, Wagner, who was head of the Forest Park Brewery, and it was built in kind of a bow art style uh, by Ernst C. Jansen in 1908. Uh, Wagner lived here for about a decade before the building was purchased by William Du Bois who is the head of Monsanto. And so he owned it uh, during the 1920s and I believe it is the 1930s. But at the time, uh, Monsanto hadn't quite grown into the, the agricultural giant that it is today. It was more of a chemical company at that time. Something really interesting is that Soja, Illinois is actually that's the modern name for the town, but originally it was called Monsanto. And basically, they just built a little town across the river so they could dump their chemicals and things there, and nobody would say anything. So, that's kind of... Nobody cares. It's down the river from St. Louis and it's from the So, this house here is yet another auto Wilhelmy design. And uh, so, like I was saying, auto Wilhelmy really loved his turrets and his towers and things in the designs of his homes. And this one was built for uh, Charles uh, Stoffergen of the Steinwender and Stoffergen Coffee Company. It's a really nice example of the uh, Richardsonian Romanesque style here in the neighborhood. Now, uh, so basically this is the house that Coffee built. So. I don't know if it's true on in Compton Heights, but in a lot of the really wealthy private street neighborhoods, uh, you basically had the captains of industry in enough different industries that they would be able to uh, s basically supply the neighborhood with everything they needed based on all the businesses that they owned. So basically it would have been self a self-sufficient neighborhood based on all the this is Halloween time, so we got a little bit of spooky -ish history <laughs> with this one. And uh, I tell it on every Compton Heights tour, regardless of if it's Halloween or not, but uh, it, it's the time of year. Speaking of Halloween, uh, next Saturday uh, at 5 p.m., I am giving my. Uh, Halloween tour of Benton Park, and then I also have one on Halloween night at 5 p.m. So, if you're interested in doing so, if you don't have anything planned for Halloween or that weekend, there's always, uh, I always give a tour of Benton Park and we talk about a lot of the kind of darker side of history. I never have weird ghost stories that are made up, it's all actual history, just like on this tour. So, uh, Anyways, back to Compton Heights. Uh, so this house, they don't actually know who the architect was, but it was built in 1894 for William T. Koken, who was a famous cast iron manufacturer in the city of St. Louis, and he was also head of the uh, Koken Barbershop Chair Company, where they made the barbershop chairs. <laughs> and so he lived at this house from 1894 to 1909. 
So what happened to him in 1909 was he was down in Seward at the Smile Building, as you may know it today. Uh, it was not called Smile back then, but it was uh, actually a bowling alley. And so he went bowling at the bowling alley, and while he was bowling, he uh, died of a heart attack at the age of 50. So that's what happened to uh, William T. Koken. Over there, that house in the distance uh, with the uh, red uh, tile roof, that house uh, was constructed in uh, 1909 in uh, kind of a prairie influence uh, style for uh, uh, Whitman of uh, uh, Whitman, Walsh, and Boiselier. And they're famous because they designed the Anheuser-Busch brew house. The new brew house. There's an old brew house that's no longer a brew house that was done by Edmund Eugenfeld in 1879. Edmund Eugenfeld also did design a house on this tour, but we're not going to get to that for a little bit longer. This house here was built in a uh, Romanesque revival style in 1890 for Zachariah uh, Wainwright Tinker. Uh, and he was the head of a malting company. And he was also kind of associated with the uh, Wainwright uh, brewing family, of, like Ellis Wainwright, the Wainwright building, Wainwright mausoleum. <laughs> he was within that family. Originally, uh, he had lived at a flounder house located um, right on Mississippi Avenue across from Lafayette Park. It's a flounder house, it's still there. And uh, he lived there from about 1880 to 1890 when he had this house built. The house was built for Philippine Lample, his wife, by her father, Lawrence Lample, and they lived there for a while. But then uh, in 1890, he had uh, garnered enough money that he decided to build himself a 6,000 square foot mansion right here on uh, Longfellow Boulevard. And so that's where you get this mansion here. So he's, I guess, one of our other beer barons uh, in the neighborhood, not associated with uh, Greece today. Halloween. Oh. Oh yeah, the one next door, the white one. Oh yeah, that one was like updated quite heavily. It was originally built in like 1890 and then updated later in like a Mediterranean revival style. Uh, this house was built uh, for uh, Charles Decree, who was uh, with the Decree, Wolfing, and Gildehouse family. And he was uh, the one of the heads of their uh, wholesale grocery company. So, yet again. Uh, and this one was built by Ernst C. Jansen in 1896 in kind of a French Renaissance style, so. Yeah, and uh, the current owner uh, has actually done quite a bit of work uh, to restore the home as well as the people from Magic Chef Mansion, they actually lived here prior to him, so it's had a lot of uh, restoration work done over the years. <laughs> By Otto Wilhelmi for uh, uh, a guy named uh, Dittmeyer 
of, and he was head of a shoe uh, company. St. Louis, during the early 20th century, had a slogan, first in booze, first in shoes, and last in the American League. <laughs> the Browns were quite terrible, just like the Cardinals were this year. But, uh, but they were terrible every year. And so the only time the by the way the only time the Browns ever went to the World Series, they faced off against the Cardinals in 1944 and lost. And, Really, all the only success they've ever really had is after they moved to Baltimore. So, but uh, basically, uh, St. Louis was a large uh, shoe manufacturing place, along with all the uh, beer brewing and stuff that we talked about. And the guy who owned this building was uh, a shoemaker. The Herman Oak Leather Company. And it was built in 1893, also by Otto Wilhelmi. This one has like a lot of uh, neoclassical elements. You got those Corinthian columns over the front porch, as well as the little uh, uh, portico type pieces over the tops of the uh, windows on the second floor. And uh, of course, Otto Wilhelmi loved his turrets, so he threw in a turret as well. <laughs> and uh, one of the nice yellow uh, brick homes here in uh, St. Louis. Yellow brick became more popular around the turn of the century. A lot of, there aren't very many <coughs> in the inner parts of the city, but as you go further west, you start seeing uh, a lot more yellow brick homes, especially in like the central west end and some of the Compton Heights in this area out here. So, the Herman Oak Leather Company actually still exists yes, it up does. in uh, North St. Louis, down on the riverfront, uh, off of, I believe, at the Angelica Street. So, it's still in existence today. And uh, this is the home of one of the original founders of the company. Wolfing, Gilda House, uh, Wholesale Groceries, Empire, and This house here was built It was built for August J. Walter of the National Candy Company. So this is like a home that was built by candy. <laughs> so, and you can tell it's a very colorful home. Uh, a lot of times you have like either brown and white or black and white uh, Tudor Revival homes. But this one has a lot more uh, color to the home. Also, this is like during the uh, craftsman slash arts and crafts period. So. 1906 so it had a little bit more color and it probably influenced by those styles as well here this was built for uh charles wolfing of the decree wolfing gilda house family and it was also designed by otto wilhelmi uh in 1894 and this one has double turrets, so you really know it's an auto Wilhelmi design. Uh, or, no, Frank E. Nolf, in my head. And, uh, um, 1910 in the Tudor Revival style. Now, uh, something interesting about this house is that, uh, Frank's father, uh, John C. Nelson, had an airplane company, uh, back in the 1920s. And he was one of the main backers of Charles Lindbergh in the spirit of St. Louis. And so Charles Lindbergh actually came and had dinner at this house on multiple occasions. Uh, 
I actually this neighbor, this section of the neighborhood, uh, like, was built all around World War One because uh, Henry C. Hart, he's uh, Henry C. Harsty had a neighbor who didn't like him and wouldn't sell off his land, and so he couldn't develop all of the street all at once, and it. Uh, Longfellow wasn't a true street, and they actually had to say that eminent domain mm -hmm. just so they could make it a true street, and that's when they finally were able to develop the rest of this area over here uh, in the early 1910s, or in the late 1900s. Uh, this house was built in 1908 by, uh, or for, uh, Leo Hadley of the Hadley Dean Glass Company. So if you look at the building, you can see there's a lot of elaborate stained glass all throughout the building. And then up on the uh, um, crest, you see there, you can see like an H and a D, like a Had and like for Hadley Dean uh, Glass Company, because uh, Leo Hadley was the head of the company and this is this is one of the nicest uh tudor revival style mansions to have been built in the city of st louis so now we're going to continue in this way hugo, hugo starkloff and he was wholesale grocer as well and uh he had this house uh, designed and built by uh, uh, Edmund Jungenfeld in 1894. Now, on May 27th, 1896, a devastating tornado came through the city of St. Louis, damaging buildings in the Compton Heights neighborhood, as well as uh, Fox Park, Lafayette Square, Square and uh, caused millions of dollars of damage actually killed 300 people so uh, this house uh, had some significant damage and had to have some major rebuilding done but uh, Edmund Jungenfeld was one of the premier uh, brewery designers in the city of St. Louis house here was built in 1895 for a uh, guy who had, uh, his last name was Thorne, and he owned a lime and cement company. It got really heavily damaged in the 1896 tornado, and had to have some rebuilding done on it as well, and the next owner was uh, John C. Nelson, who was head of the Missouri Malleable Iron Company. And so he made all of the iron for the cast iron manufacturers to uh, use in their storefronts and whatnot. And he owned it until uh, I believe it was about 1911. And then uh, in 1911, it was purchased by Paul Griesedek. So uh, this one's another Griesedek family home. This home has one of the most fascinating histories in the Compton Heights neighborhood. And it was owned by a guy named Hugo Munch. And uh, Hugo Munch was the ambassador to Germany for the United States uh, during the period just leading up to World War I. And uh, basically, uh, at this time, uh, uh, and he also, he had a son uh, who uh, married the daughter of Julius Thamer, who was a brewer here in the city of St. Louis. So uh, the Thamer family and the Munch family were connected, and he built his, had his home built here by none other than Otto Wilhelmy in 1893. So uh, anyway... Uh, this is a very interesting time to be ambassador to Germany because this is right around the time that 
Kaiser Wilhelm II uh, took over uh, the full reins of everything as far as the military and the industrial industrialization of Germany was concerned, and he actually uh, uh, fired Otto von Bismarck uh, just a little bit earlier than this in 1890. So uh, he was the ambassador at the time when uh, Germany was kind of in a uh, very aggressive state building up their military and wanting to become a superpower and at this time France and England were not happy and then they tried to have a uh, alliance with Russia at one point but then uh, I guess they got too aggressive for Russia and so Russia actually took sides with France and England and they formed the Triple Entente to try to uh, put some uh, reins in on Germany, but Germany was building a navy like no one else, and had some of the most, uh, the finest world-class battleships and things like that, and it wasn't long after they had the U-boats and everything like that, so Germany was really, really ramping things up, and, uh, it's really scared France in particular, because they had just fought in the Franco-Prussian War about two decades earlier so basically it was a very tumultuous time to be the ambassador then world war one happens and what's really interesting is that st louis a lot of the people especially in this neighborhood probably him and his neighbors probably, and just everybody around here benton park seward as well they all sent money to germany like a lot of Americans have sent money and things to Ukraine to help them out. Like the Germans here send all that money to Germany, who would later become an enemy of the United States after the Zimmerman telegram. And it was in following that there was actually major, major anti German sentiment here in St. Louis and they began to teach in German in schools. They got rid of the German names on some of the streets, like, um, Pershing used to be called Berlin, and then they named it after the general of the United States Army during World War I, and Enright used to be von Bursen, they changed it to Enright after, uh, the first, uh, U.S. casual, or the first, uh, casualty of someone from St. Louis in the war, and, uh, just various other things like that. I think Bismarck got changed to just Fourth Street or something. And basically, they and they also tried to shut down the German language newspapers, but they were unsuccessful at that. And they were really just, in large part, unsuccessful at really killing the German culture in St. Louis because it clearly stuck around, and there were just far too many Germans here in St. Louis. And anybody who's had a long standing, uh, like mo most white people who've had long standing uh, ties to St. Louis have some German ancestry because the German ancestry in St. Louis was that interwoven in the city that there, there was no getting rid of it and it still stands strong today even. When these houses were first built, what kind of heat did they have? Uh, they would have like cool uh, definitely cool. Um, but they would have, like, fireplaces, and, uh, later on, and I think these guys were actually right at the beginning of radiator heating, so, uh, depending on where you lived, you, you probably had radiator heating, you wouldn't have had cold, like, and wood-burning furnaces, it was still a thing at that time, but it was kind of right in the transitional period. By the way, this house also had some damage in the 1896 tornado, and that's why the gable up top is kind of plain compared to the rest of the house. It used to be actually a lot more decorative up top before that happened. So. Well, my battery ran out.
during the tour there, but this house at 2900 Russell was built in 1883 for Henry and Herman Koch, of whom were salesmen for Crow, Hergadine, and Company Dry Goods in the 1880s. By the 1890s, they were salesmen for the Eli and Walker Dry Goods Company, founded by David Walker. who was the great-grandfather of George H.W. Bush and the great-great-grandfather of George W. Bush. It was designed in the Italianate style and has elements of the Gothic Revival style as well. The address was changed from 3000 Russell in 1891. So St. Louis has ties to the Bush beer family as well as the President Bushes. So thanks again for watching. This is our tour of the Compton Heights neighborhoods.